All right, very last screencast of the semester. I am going to shut it here. Okay, market failures in the role of government. That's our unit, our very last screencast, the microeconomics of taxation. So we've been talking about government in this unit, and there's um, a very specific way the government pays for what it's doing, which is obviously to tax people. Um, we're going to talk a lot more about taxes in the next semester in macro. Um, for now, we're focusing on the microeconomics of taxation. So governments tax people generally for two reasons. First, to pay for the costs of government. Firefighters cost money, tanks cost money, roads cost money. And then secondly, and this is more of a democratic or a liberal concern, to redistribute income. If you remember the Lorenz curve, we don't live in a perfectly equal society or equal distribution. Um, and some people feel that it's perfectly appropriate to take money from some people and redistribute it to other people. Um, and there's an economic case to be made for that. You know, there's marginal, diminishing marginal utility to all things, including money. So a dollar to Bill Gates isn't really the same thing as a dollar to someone who's poor. And there might be a utility gain to be had to take a dollar away from someone like Bill Gates and give it to someone who has nothing. <clears throat> That's a kind of something we can talk about for quite a while. All right, so there's a couple of principles of taxation. In other words, the government uses one of two principles when deciding who it is that they want to tax. The first principle is called the ability to pay principle. And what that principle says is that we should tax those who are most able to pay the tax without causing harm. So if we're going to build like a library or build a road and we have to come up with some money for it, we should come up with that money from people that won't really miss the money so much. In other words, this is a fancy way of saying we should tax basically rich people. Now, for obvious reasons, liberals tend to like this principle of taxation. So it doesn't really matter what we're building or what we're doing or why we're doing it. Just tax the rich people. The second principle is called the benefits received principle. What the benefits received principle says is that we should tax those who are getting the benefit of government actions. So for example, if we're going to build a road, we should tax people who are going to use the road, maybe have a gasoline tax. Uh, so for example, tax drivers to pay for road projects. Conservatives tend to like that principle, and I think there's an element of fair fairness in each. Um, it makes sense to tax people who are getting the benefit of it. On the other hand, for things like welfare, where we're trying to help out poor people, it might not make sense to tax those people since we'd just be taking the money away from them. All right, so those are the two principles of taxation. And again, your political philosophy kind of informs which one of those you like. Once you've decided who it is you're going to tax, you have to decide what type of tax to impose. Now, there are many, many types of taxes, income taxes, sales taxes, estate taxes, gas taxes, social security taxes, lots of others. What interests economists isn't really so much the particular type of tax, but rather who it is in the economy that actually winds up paying the tax and how much of it. So we're going to talk about three types of taxes here. All taxes can be put in one of three categories. The first category are called progressive taxes. And with these taxes, the richer you are, the higher your income, the higher our tax rate you pay. The second type is called a proportional or a flat tax, which says that regardless of your income, everyone pays the same rate, the same percentage. And then finally, regressive taxes, which with these, the more you earn, the higher your income, the smaller a percentage, the smaller a tax rate you pay. Now, you might want to ask, in the interest of fairness, why any tax would be that way. Um, you might, you'll be surprised to find out that most taxes actually are regressive, and we'll talk about why you might want to have a regressive tax. All right, so let me give you a simple example. Let's take three people, a poor person who's making ten grand a year, a middle class person making 50000 a year, and a wealthy person making 200000 a year. A progressive tax would tax the richest person with the highest tax rate. So maybe charge the poor person 5%, the middle income person 10% of their income, the rich person 15% of their income. A proportional tax would tax everyone at exactly the same rate, maybe 10% for everyone. And a regressive tax would tax the poor person at a higher rate and the wealthy person at a lower rate. 
All right, well, let's take these percentages and multiply it by these people in, people's incomes to see exactly the dollar amount of taxes they would pay under these three kinds of taxes. Look at the red numbers, and that's what those would be. So you can see what's going on here. In a progressive system, the poor person would pay 500 bucks, the middle class person 5,000, and the wealthy person 30,000. Again, there's diminishing marginal utility to money, so this might make sense. And liberals tend to like progressive taxes. Take bigger and bigger chunks away from the wealthier and wealthier you are, because money taken away from you doesn't hurt you quite as much as money taken away from a poor person. Under a proportional system, the taxes would be 1,000, 5,000, and 20,000, 10% of each of their incomes. And under a regressive system, notice that we're still taking more dollars away from the rich person, because we're taking a smaller percentage, 5%, but 5% of a bigger amount, $200,000. So some people argue for regressive taxes simply because it will equal out a little bit more uh, how much taxes people pay. And some people feel like, look, we're all in society together, we're all getting the benefit of government services. It's not really fair for some people to pay, you know, tons and tons of money in taxes and other people to pay too little. And in those kind of situations, you might want a regressive tax. So conservatives tend to like proportional or regressive taxes. Liberals tend to favor progressive taxes. Now taxes are deceptive, and sometimes what seems like a flat tax or a proportional tax or a progressive tax might be a regressive tax. I'll give you an example. Imagine that the state of Minnesota passes a new sales tax of 10% on all purchases. Now that seems like a proportional or a flat tax, 10% regardless of your income, right? But it actually isn't. Say that there, uh, we have Joe who earns $100,000 a year. And let's say Joe spends $50,000 a year on goods and services. Joe is going to pay 10% of $50,000 or $5,000 in taxes. That's 5% of his income, 5,000 out of his $100,000 income. He's only subjecting half of his income to this tax, the other half he's assumingly putting in the bank. Let's say Sam makes 25000 so Sam is poorer than Joe, spends all of his money on goods and services. Sam's going to pay 25000 times 10% or $2,500 in taxes, which is 10% of his income. Well, look what's going on here. Joe's paying 5% of his income in taxes. Sam's paying 10% of his income in taxes because he's exposing all of his money to that tax. This seemingly flat tax is actually a regressive tax, and lots of taxes in our society actually work that way. All right, so finally, and I said to end on this note simply because it's a complicated note, <clears throat> we're going to talk about what are called tax incidents and deadweight loss. Deadweight loss we've seen before, tax incidents is new. Tax incidence refers to the idea that regardless of who the government says it's taxing, um, it may or may not be, be paid by the people the government feels like it's actually taxing. Uh, let me restate that. Tax incidence is basically who actually winds up paying the tax. And what we're going to see is that elasticity is important. And if you memorize nothing else, memorize this. The more inelastic you are, the more of the tax you pay. If demand is relatively inelastic, consumers wind up paying more of a tax. And if supply is relatively more inelastic, producers wind up paying more of the tax, regardless of who's actually paying the tax to the government. So we're going to take as an example an excise tax, which is a tax on producers. Um, we might say to cigarette manufacturers, for example, for every pack of cigarettes you produce, you have to give the government $3. That would be an example of an excise tax. All right, so let's say we're talking about the market for burritos, and let's say that this market's at equilibrium, and that in the market, P star equilibrium price is $8, and Q star is 1,000 burritos. So maybe the market for burritos looks like this. Now the government comes along and imposes an excise tax of $2 per burrito. So the burrito manufacturer is going to have to hand the government at the end of the day $2 for every burrito they produce and sell. An excise tax is a per unit tax on producers. 
So for every burrito they now sell, they're going to have to hand the government $2. Remember what happens to the supply curve way back from the beginning of the year when it becomes harder or more expensive to produce? The government has now essentially added $2 to the cost of producing each burrito. Remember supply is a proxy for marginal cost. So instead of the supply, the marginal cost being here, for example, let's say producing one burrito cost $3 before, that first unit isn't going to cost $3 to produce anymore. With the tax, now that burrito is going to cost $5 to produce. That cost is going to be up there. And all the other units are going to cost $2 more to produce as well. Essentially, what we're going to get is a new supply curve. And we can call that supply curve the supply plus the tax. That vertical distance between the red supply curve and the black supply curve is the amount of the tax. That's going to lead us to a new equilibrium, new equilibrium price and a new equilibrium quantity. Now that this tax is in place, burritos are going to wind up costing $9 and we're going to have 800 burritos. Again, that $2 excise tax can be represented by the vertical distance between the old supply curve and the new supply curve. That green line right there, that little vertical green line, that's our $2 excise tax. We push the costs up, we reduce supply by $2 per unit. Now the $2 at the end of the day is going to get handed to the government by the producer, but consumers actually wait, uh, wind up paying a part of that tax. They don't hand the, government, the money to the government, but they wind up paying a part of that tax in the form of higher prices. Because look, before they went to the store and they were paying $8 for a burrito, and now when they go to the store they're going to pay $9 for a burrito. So the tax incidence on consumers is the amount by which price is risen. In this case, that little purple vertical line right here. It's the difference between the $8 they were paying before and the $9 they're paying now. We're going to call that the tax incidence on consumers, in this case a dollar. Producers pay whatever it is that consumers don't. So consumers are paying a dollar worth of that tax. In our case, producers are going to pay the rest, the remainder of that vertical green line or the little blue line that you see there. That's the tax incidence on producers. The government's going to wind up collecting $1,600 in taxes, 800 units times the $2 tax. And lastly, one of the problems with taxes is that we're going to experience some deadweight loss. I'm hoping that you're going to be able to see it right there. Those are units, units 801 through 1000, where the benefit exceeded the cost for society, but that aren't going to get produced any longer because of this tax. Crying babies, deadweight loss. Now in this example, the elasticities of supply and demand were about equal, which is why each of them wound up paying about half of the tax, a dollar each. If demand had been very inelastic and supply was very elastic, we would have seen a different result. So assume the same $2 excise tax. Here we have a very inelastic demand curve, kind of straight up and down, very flat, elastic supply curve. When we add that $2 tax, the supply curve would look like this. We might call it supply plus tax. We get a new equilibrium price and quantity. Here the price is $9.75, the quantity 900. Now, what you should notice is that consumers are going to wind up paying more of the tax. Remember, the more inelastic you are, the more of the tax you wind up paying. So again, that vertical distance, that green line, represents the amount of the tax, that's $2. Tax incidence on consumers is the amount of that tax represented in the form of higher prices. Consumers were paying $8 for a burrito, and now they're paying $9.75, which is $1.75 more than they were paying before. Out of that $2 excise tax, consumers are actually paying most of it, $1.75. 
The remainder of that little green line, this little piece here, that is the tax incidence on producers, 25 cents. In this case, the government's going to wind up collecting $1,800 in revenues, $2 times the 900 units that are being bought and sold. So finally, I just want to talk very briefly about the difference between conservatives and liberals from this whole economic point of view. You might have your own political definition. Conservatives tend to think that power given to government is power taken away from individuals. It's a zero-sum game. When we give government the power to tax, or the power to deal with public uh, goods, or the power to deal with externalities, we're taking our money and giving it to the government. So conservatives see the government as essentially stealing freedom. Whatever power we might use with that money, we're essentially handing over to the government. And they think that taxes are necessary, but only to the extent that they pay for vital government services, like police or national defense, stuff like that. From an economic point of view, liberals see it exactly the opposite. They think that government power can actually expand our freedom, that it's not a zero-sum game. They might cite, for an example, a traffic light. You know, that's a rule that the government's imposing, but by having things like traffic lights, it gives us the freedom to actually move around. Without something like a traffic light, travel in cars might not be possible. They also think that taxes are necessary to pay for government, but more than that, they're willing to use taxes to redistribute income get money from the rich and give it to the poor. All right, that brings us to the end of this little journey, microeconomic journey. Uh, it was good for me. Hopefully, hopefully it was good for you too. See you in macro.